Okay, so with that we can jump into our PowerPoint slides and try and catch up with what we had just mentioned. We've got the four tissue types listed. Here is a quick representation of where you find those. We said the nervous tissue is sending rapid electrical impulses. So the brain, the spinal cord, and then nerves throughout the body are comprised of this nervous tissue. Muscle tissue, we said there was the skeletal muscle tissue that allows you to move around and write notes. There's the cardiac muscle tissue that circulates blood through the, you know, pumps blood through the vessels. There is smooth muscle that's found in the walls of blood vessels and in the walls of the digestive system. These are probably the best models that show smooth muscle because they both are cross sections through blood vessels. The middle one is an artery and on either side there are veins and if you look in the walls of those blood vessels you can see this layer of smooth muscle. I have a, a microscope set up out there looking through the walls of a blood vessel so that we can see smooth muscle. So we've mentioned the three muscle types. That takes us to epithelial tissue that we know uh, cover, covers some body surface, either an inside or outside body surface, and then all of the glandular tissue comes from epithelial tissue. And connective tissue was a broad group. It stores nutrients. It provides support as well as connections. Let's start at the top by looking at some characteristics of epithelial tissue. If you're following along in the class notes, there's going to be four special characteristics that are unique to epithelial tissue. We already know that we find it at places where the body surface meets a different environment, so outside and inside body surfaces, as well as glandular tissue. So if we're going to list those four special characteristics, the first characteristic is called polarity. And that's the image that you, you have drawn on one of the pages of your lecture handouts. It shows in epithelial tissue, the cells have this polarity to them. Let me draw that a little bit larger, meaning that the different sides of a cell are going to be doing different functions. For example, we know that epithelial tissue is always going to be anchored down to some type of basement membrane. Let's label this the basement membrane. This basement membrane is made out of connective tissue. Specifically that areolar tissue. But let's not get down into the connective tissue yet. We're thinking about epithelial tissue that's going to be on a surface. When we're thinking about epithelial tissue, we're going to see that it has different sides to the cells that, that have completely different functions. For example, the side of the cell that faces the... Here's the example that I'm drawing. This is a uh, columnar-shaped epithelial cell. We find these columnar-shaped epithelial cells lining the small intestines. And their job is to absorb nutrients. So let's put uh, some food as it's moving through the digestive system. And this food is going to get broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. And eventually these pieces are going to be absorbed into the cells that line the small intestines. And then they're going to make their way through the cell and eventually they're going to hop into a blood vessel. Maybe we'll get a little, little color, write this as a capillary. So nutrients have been absorbed across this abdominal wall into the blood vessels and are now distributed all over the body. These epithelial cells that line the surface, in this case the ones that line the surface of the small intestines, we're going to see that the apical surface always has these adaptations that increase surface area. That's always on the apical side, the side that faces the body surface. We can see increased surface area making it easier for things to move into the cell. So it has a specialized apical surface. Let's label these uh, 
sides of the cell. The, the side that I'm labeling or drawing with these adaptations to increase surface area, this is the apical surface. We're going to see the basal surface down here also has special adaptations for anchoring down into the basement membrane. Kind of like the roots of a plant, it has these specialized structures for anchoring into connective tissue. Let's refer to this side as the basal surface. And then we have the lateral sides, the lateral surface of these cells is also specialized. Uh, and this one is specialized for anchoring to other epithelial cells. This is where I get confused as to if this is something that we mention in our A and P class or if it's something that I just constantly mention in biology class. But either way, it's applicable. When we're thinking about these cell connections, between epithelial cells, the lateral sides of epithelial cells are held together by what we call tight junctions. Tight junctions are like a zipper. I'm looking for somebody that's wearing, would you stand up real quick with me? Hop up. So, so there are two types of cell junctions. There are cell junctions that are like the buttons on my shirt that hold the two cells together, but there are little gaps, so things that can, you know, can move through. And then other cell connections are like the zipper in her jacket that if she zips it all the way up, there, there's an effective seal between those two cells. Nothing can cross through. And thank you. The cells that line the small intestines are like this because Sometimes you'll hear food has been recalled or there's salmonella on lettuce or something has been recalled. So on the food that we eat, if there's some type of pathogen in there, we don't want that pathogen to be able to sneak between the cells and get directly into the bloodstream and then be spread all over the body. These tight junctions prevent that and they make sure the only way substances can go from the inside lining of the digestive system into the bloodstream is to pass through the apical surface of one of these cells. Inside the cells, we're going to have enzymes that are able to break down pathogens that don't belong. Uh, there are immune functions inside each cell that cleanse things that shouldn't end up in the bloodstream. Again, probably additional knowledge. The main point is that when we're talking about epithelial tissue, each side of the cell has its own unique functions. So basal surface for anchoring to the basement membrane, lateral surfaces for anchoring to other epithelial cells, and the apical surface for absorption or secretion. The second characteristic that we'll list for epithelial cells is that there are many cells when we talk about connective tissue, for example, there are going to be cells, but they're spaced out from one another. Same thing with muscle cells. A lot of times there's some distance or some space between those muscle cells. Certainly that's the case with nervous tissue. But in epithelial cells, we see a bunch of cells very closely packed together. So if we look at the slides over there that show us the cells that make up the lining of the stomach or the small intestines, we can see a bunch of closely packed together cells. Specialized sides, many cells closely packed together. That's number two. Number three is that these epithelial tissues are going to not have direct blood supply to them. Notice how I've drawn the capillary down here in the basement membrane. It's the capillary is embedded in the connective tissue there is no direct blood supply to epithelial tissue. There is nerve supply. I don't have a color that, that, that I can use to draw a nerve since I've already used this green color. But I'll show it a picture on the next slide that looks like this. It shows blood vessels staying down in the connective tissue 
but nerve tissue actually leaving the connective tissue and anchoring into some of these epithelial cells. You know this if you've ever reached into a bag and had a paper cut. Have you ever had a paper cut that you feel that you, you, you felt it, you damaged your finger somehow, but then when you look at the paper cut, cut if it isn't deep enough, it might not have drawn blood. That happens to me sometimes I'm reaching in the drawer for a razor uh, and I grab the wrong end of the razor, that's happened before, and I've definitely cut the ends of my finger and I felt that it, that it did cut, but when I looked at it, it didn't go deep enough that it got into blood vessels, so I, not, I was not yet bleeding. So epithelial cells are intervated, meaning that they have nerve supply, but they are not, they don't have direct blood supply meaning they are avascular. So let's go back to this. Avascular, no direct blood supply, but innervated means they do have nerve supply. We can feel it when we cut them. And then finally, the last characteristic that's unique to epithelial cells is that all epithelial tissue has a very rapid rate of regeneration. It takes about 21 days for the cells on the surface of your skin to be replaced. That's far faster than any other type of tissue will be able to replace itself. <coughs> it kind of makes sense for epithelial tissue since it's always on a body surface. It's having to deal with changes in the outside environment or things that move through your digestive system. So it makes sense that it goes through multiple copies. Back to this picture, we can see all of those four special characteristics. The fact that the individual sides of these epithelial cells are specialized. They have polarity. The different sides of the cells are doing different things. Basal surface for anchoring into connective tissue. Apical surface for absorption or secretion of nutrients. We can see lateral surfaces for anchoring to other epithelial cells. Let's look at some examples of where we find epithelial tissue. And if you have your lab list, we should cross each of those off. The first one on the lab list is simple squamous epithelial tissue. Let me erase this. If we're thinking about our first example of epithelial tissue, uh, the first example that we see is simple squamous epithelial tissue. So it's got a long name. Simple, the first part, just tells us how many layers there are. Simple always refers to just a single layer. Squamous, in this case, refers to one of those three types of epithelial cells. Squamous was the flat pancake-shaped cell. And then the last part tells you what type of tissue we're talking about, epithelial tissue. We know this is going to be lining some type of surface. And the image that we're looking at here is through the alveoli of the lungs. When we get all the way into the lungs, we're going to see at the very ends of those pockets of the lungs, there are single layers of squamous shaped cells. Being that they are flat with lots of surface area, not a lot of volume, it's easy for things to just diffuse across a single layer of squamous shaped cells. So we, we typically see these in areas where there is diffusion taking place, things moving across the surface of the cell. Uh, I said the surface of the lungs is where we're going to see this. The first microscope is set up to show simple squamous epithelium. It's set up to show this exact picture this is inside the blood vessels of the kidneys. And when you're looking at a tissue slide, it's going to show you a bunch of different things that you're not trying to look at. But somewhere on that slide is the type of tissue we're looking for. And so often I will use an arrow to point out what type of tissue are we trying to find on this slide. And you'll notice around this little circular structure, 
kind of making the perimeter of this structure is a single layer of squamous shaped epithelial cells. You can barely make out the nucleus being stretched into kind of an oval shape. So we're not looking at any of this other stuff. And that's maybe noteworthy. If you haven't looked into some of these microscopes, you might want to uh, make some type of mental note that in one of these two eyepieces is a pointer just like that. If you look into there, sometimes my eyes, I like to cover one eye. You're not really, you can adjust these, the width of these to fit your eye. But sometimes if you're lazy and you just peek into there with one eye, if you're not looking in the right eyepiece, you won't see the pointer. So, so just know if you're looking in the wrong one, if you don't see a pointer, just pop your head in the other one. And I'm, I'm trying to point to the specific tissue that we're looking for. You'll see a pointer in this one pointing right to the single layer of squamous shaped epithelial cells. Also in the kidney, but now we're looking at a single layer of cube shaped epithelial cells. These are going to be lining kidney tubules. And I'll agree that that is not a perfect square, but the cube shaped cells at best we can describe them as being about as tall as they are wide. They're not squamous. They're not columnar. At best, we can describe them as cuboidal. There is the second microscope. Each of these microscopes, I have in front of them the picture that I'm trying to display. So you can quickly get an idea of what you're supposed to see before you stick your eye in the eyepiece. So a single layer of cuboidal shaped epithelial cells. So this picture we said, we would describe this as simple cuboidal. Simple cuboidal epithelial cells like we're seeing are about as tall as they are wide. It's not a perfect square. But we're seeing multiple layers of these cube shaped cells and they're all anchored down to some type of basement membrane. In this case, we can see that connective tissue just on the other side that they're anchoring to. Here's a sketch of that kidney tubule slide where we see a single layer of cells that are about as tall as they are wide. Maybe a side note, some of these slides are labeled with the word epithelium. And sometimes you'll see slides, or I'll write it on the board, where it says epithelial tissue. Probably a small thing. This is the correct way to write it. You can either say epithelial tissue, or if you didn't want to use the word tissue, you could just say simple cuboidal epithelium. This is also correct. What you would not want to do is say simple cuboidal epithelium tissue. That would be wrong. You wouldn't say epithelium tissue. It would be epithelial tissue or just epithelium. You can use either one. Here's a slide of simple cuboidal epithelium. And you can see the problem with using slides sometimes is that in this case, 90% of this slide is trash. None, I would say most of this is not practical quality, except right here. There's a good example of simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. We can see like all epithelial tissue, it's lining some type of surface. In this case, it's the surface of a kidney tubule. So simple cuboidal, now we're, we have switched to simple columnar epithelial tissue. In simple columnar epithelial tissue, the cells are clearly taller than they are wide. You also will see the nuclei are going to line up at about the same place in the cell. That's one thing that makes it easy to see that we're looking at a single layer of columnar shaped cells.
So simple columnar epithelium. You'll find this in places like the lining of the stomach, the small intestines, and the large intestines. Here is an actual picture of simple columnar epithelial tissue. The rest of this stuff is not what we're trying to look for. Only right here do we see the simple columnar epithelial tissue. Okay, let's try this one. This one is no longer, we can't call it simple cuboidal or simple columnar epithelial tissue. It, well, let's describe it this way. Pseudostratified is telling us that it is falsely stratified. You can add the word ciliated if you would like. It just describes that the apical surface of this tissue does have cilia. Side note, what a cilia is going to do is beat back and forth and distribute mucus evenly across the surface of these cells. Those are goblet cells producing this mucus and then the cilia distribute that mucus evenly across the surface. But when we look at the cells, you can see that the nuclei appear jumbled. It appears that these nuclei are stacked on top of one another, but in reality, that's not really the case. Each individual cell comes down and attaches to the basement membrane all by itself. However, the nuclei are not in the same position of the cell. Let me go back to simple columnar. We can see that the nuclei more or less line up. Even here, the nuclei are more or less lining up at the same level of the cell. When we go to pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue, the nuclei are sometimes located at the top of the cell or in the middle of the cell or way down here at the bottom of the cell. It gives the appearance that there's more than one layer when there's really not. Maybe make a note that we see this falsely stratified tissue in places like the trachea and the upper respiratory tract, the larger bronchioles that go into the lungs. Here is a picture of what it looks like in a microscope. We can see cells that are clearly taller than they are wide and you can also see nuclei are distributed all over the cell. Some of these nuclei are up close to the apical surface, others are down near the basal surface, some nuclei are in the middle. So it appears that there's multiple layers when there are really not. We can see this in the trachea. And the sketch over here does a good job of showing you how spread out the location of nuclei can be in these particular columnar shaped cells. But if you look closely, you'll see that each cell comes down and touches the basement membrane all on its own. This is also pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue, but I've, I've decided that this is not quality enough to put on a practical. So the pictures that we have in lab are better than this. I think it looks closer to this. Almost done with epithelial tissue. On your lab list, you'll notice that once we talk about simple layers or single layers of epithelial cell, there are a couple of examples of stratified squamous. There is keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, and then what we're going to call non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Keratin is just the protein that waterproofs your cells. It also kills off your cells. Imagine if you were to waterproof yourself, if you put yourself in a Ziploc bag, nutrients would no longer be able to find their way in and waste wouldn't be able to get out. That's what's happened to cells that are keratinized. They have been waterproofed and now they are just there as a layer of protection. Keratinized epithelial tissue is found on the outside surface of the body. We have multiple dead layers of keratinized cells that are there for protection and for waterproofing. 
when people get covered in severe burns, one of the main concerns is that they're going to lose too much water, that they're going to dehydrate because the surface of the skin of the body's main job is to hold water in to prevent dehydration. And the multiple layers of waterproofed cells allow us to do that. So keratinized epithelial tissue is on the outside surface of the body. Non-keratinized stratified squamous is on an inside surface of the body. If I can flip my cheek inside out and show you the inside lining of my cheek, there would be multiple layers of non-keratinized uh, stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Look at how you can still see the nuclei of the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial cells. These cells are not waterproofed. They're still able to get nutrients in and waste out. However, when we look at keratinized epithelial tissue, you no longer see nuclei in there because the cells have died off. Here are more examples of the non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Looking at the shape of the cells, we can tell that it is clearly not cuboidal. It's not columnar. We have these flat pancake-shaped cells. There's clearly more than one layer of them. So stratified squamous epithelial tissue. We, we could add the term non-keratinized because we can see these cells are not waterproofed or dead yet. So lining the uh, oral cavity or the inside of the cheek, here's our stratified squamous epithelial tissue, non-keratinized version. And before we get away from epithelial tissue, uh, you may notice that on the lab list, we don't have things like stratified cuboidal, but we did have a picture of it. Things like stratified cuboidal tissue uh, are sometimes found in glands. So it is rare, but it is something that you see in the body. You will see stratified cuboidal epithelial tissue. And in some digestive glands, there are even multiple layers of columnar shaped cells. So stratified columnar epithelial tissue, again, typically in digestive glands, it is not as common, but there is a question in your lecture handout that wants to know, is there more, more than one type of stratified epithelial tissue? And, and you could now know there is more than one type of stratified epithelial tissue. There's stratified squamous, there's stratified cuboidal, and there's stratified columnar. The latter two, like we said, stratified cuboidal and stratified columnar are rare, but show up in glandular tissue. The last type of epithelial tissue that we introduce is called transitional epithelium, and it's found only in the urinary bladder and the ureters, which are these tubes that lead to the urinary bladder. What the transitional epithelial tissue can do is it allows the tissue to stretch and accommodate larger volumes, in this case, larger volumes of urine. Mm -hmm. When the cells are rounded this way, the bladder is not stretched, it's not full. But if it were to become completely full, you would see these cells take on more of a flattened appearance. In this microscope. In front of it, I've got a picture of our transitional epithelium. And you can peek in there to see the inside tube. It's, it's a cross section through one of those ureters right there. And you can see the inside of that tube lined with this transitional epithelium. Here's a sketch of the transitional epithelium. I think this slide looks more like what you would see on a practical. 
just another sketch of transitional epithelium. The giveaway is that the cells get larger as you get closer towards this apical surface. Okay, before we get away from epithelial tissue, we said that all of the different types of glands also are derived from epithelial tissue. This cell that we're looking at here is called a goblet cell. It is noteworthy because it is the only single-celled gland in the entire body. We'll mention a lot of glands, and most of them are comprised of multiple cells. But the goblet cell is a single cell that can be considered a gland. It produces mucus, and it secretes mucus onto this apical surface where the cilia distributed evenly. So goblet cells are part of this epithelial tissue. Here is a multicellular gland. We can see uh, part of the pancreas is going to have cells that look like this that secrete digestive enzymes from their apical surfaces. If we go back and forth between these two different types of glands, we'll see that one type of gland secretes enzymes without destroying itself. This type of secretion we're going to call, uh, it's a type of marocrine gland. I'm trying to say. Marocrine secretions or marocrine glands are going to secrete their products, in this case a digestive enzyme, without self-destruction. <coughs> We'll see several examples of this type of gland. I've, I've given digestive glands as one example. Uh, in the pancreas, we'll see these cells that are producing all kinds of enzymes that break down whatever you're eating, carbohydrates, lipids, or proteins. The cells are fine. They're able to continuously uh, secrete their digestive enzymes. Versus a second category of gland called holocrine glands. Um, some of your apocrine glands, so in the armpit, you're going to have glands that when they secrete their products, the entire cell ruptures and dies off. And the only way that these glands could continuously produce substances is by having a continuous supply of new cells. So in marocrine glands, we have intense cell division, hence the picture of rapidly dividing cells. And as these cells mature, before they secrete their substances, they have to completely rupture, which kills off that cell. So holocrine cells maybe think they give their whole life, basically, to secrete their products. Where these marocrine glands, meh, you know, they're, they're just going to donate the products that they produce. They're not self-destructing. Two types of glands. Let's look at some questions before we look at the scopes. This is, the blue line is the basement membrane. So that tells us where the connective tissue starts. And then on top of that connective tissue, we have a particular type of tissue. What would we call this type of tissue if we saw it on a picture in a practical? That one right there. It's a type of epithelial tissue. And it's on the lab list. I'm hearing it. Simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. Right? So this would be simple because it's a single layer, cuboidal because the cells are about as tall as they are wide. And we would say that it's, it's obviously epithelial tissue because it's lining some type of body surface. In this case, a tube of the body. What about... That seems kind of fuzzy, but if I step back, I can see nuclei that are lining up at the same level of the cell. I can see cells that are taller than they are wide, kind of like what we have drawn on the board. Maybe not practical quality, but this should be a single layer of columnar-shaped epithelial tissue. Simple columnar epithelial tissue. Here is, it would be maybe a little better if we could zoom in to see that there are multiple layers of cells and we can still see the nuclei in each of those cells. Still make out some nuclei there. 
what would we call this type of tissue? The pointer would be pointing somewhere in this vicinity. Is that a good one? It's a type of epithelial tissue. If it was transitional, we would see the cells become larger and kind of more plump on the surface. And that's not really what we're seeing. But that was a good guess. It's the stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And you're right, it's non-keratinized stratified squamous. You just make some money there, good job. Uh, we just talked about epithelial tissue. And we are about to switch gears and talk about connective tissue. But before we do, there are a couple of slides that, that mention what are called body membranes. And body membranes, like this slide is telling us, are two things. It's, it's comprised of two tissue types. Each body membrane is part epithelial tissue, which is going to be on the surface. And then, like we have drawn all along, anytime we're drawing epithelial tissue, it's always connected to some type of basement membrane that's made out of connective tissue. So epithelial tissue and connective tissue are always together. And there are a few places where we find epithelial tissue and connective tissue together in places of the body that we describe as membranes. There are going to be three membranes that we'll mention at this point in the class. The only other membrane that we will not mention at this point is the synovial membranes that are responsible for the movements of the body. But let's look at three common body membranes. All membranes, like we said, are going to be part epithelial and part connective tissue. The first one to mention is the cutaneous membrane. And I'm looking around the room for a... The skin model could work as an example of the cutaneous membrane. But I could also grab one of the torso models that are in the back corner and just point to the surface of the torso model. Any skin surface, this is referring to the cutaneous membrane. Think maybe its main purpose is for waterproofing the outside of the body. So cutaneous membrane. The second membrane to mention is the mucous membrane. And this is going to be the membrane that lines internal passageways. So the digestive tract is lined by this mucous membrane. The respiratory tract is lined by a mucous membrane. The urinary tract is lined by a mucous membrane. The reproductive tract is lined by a mucous membrane. All of these internal tracts are lined by mucous membranes. And the third membrane that we mentioned is called a serous membrane. Serous membranes are going to be wrapped around internal organs. There is an in, a separate serous membrane that just wraps around the heart. We're going to refer to that as the pericardial membrane. There are these pleural membranes that wrap around individual lungs. And then we'll see around abdominal organs, there is the peritoneal membrane. Let's see where we have to write that in our lecture notes. I'm going to pull away from the slides for just a second and go back to our lecture notes because as we transition from epithelial cells to connective tissue, I've, I've mentioned membrane. So I just want to go to this last page to clarify what I was trying to get you to write in each of these boxes. The first column when we're thinking about our types of membranes, you, you have to fill in some of these, but I've given you already the three serous membranes. But you haven't yet filled in the specific serous membrane that we're talking about. There's the plural serous membrane that wraps around the lungs. There's another serous membrane that wraps around the heart. And then still yet uh, a third serous membrane that wraps around those abdominal pelvic organs. We just saw it on this slide, and I'll click back to that slide in a second so that you can label those specific serous membranes. But the other ones that we were talking about are either the mucous membrane or the cutaneous membrane. So let's look at uh, potential locations. The outer surface of the body, this could only be talking about what type of membrane? Cutaneous membrane, and that means that there's, 
this would only be filled in for serous membranes. So you can just put an X in this spot. We're talking about cutaneous membranes for the outer surface of the body. Nothing goes in this middle box. So let's move down to the next one. This is going to, well, lines the mouth. What membrane would that be? That's the mucous membrane, and obviously we can cross off this middle column. Nothing goes here since we're talking about a mucous membrane. But now we're at a serous membrane, and we have to write in the middle column, what specific serous membrane are we talking about that goes around the heart? We just saw it. What was it? The pericardial cavity is what goes around the heart. Pericardial membrane. So in the middle here, we've got one of the membranes that lines the inside of the stomach. What would that be? Lines the stomach. That would be a mucous membrane. Same as the very bottom here, lines the urinary or reproductive tracts. This is also a mucous membrane. So we don't have to put anything in the middle column for the mucous membranes. But finally, the last serous membrane that wraps around that abdominal pelvic cavity, there is the peritoneum. And here's that question I mentioned. You would expect to find epithelial tissue at any place where the body meets the environment. This one is true, but the second one is not true. This says there is only one type of stratified epithelium in the human body. And we know there are other types of stratified epithelium. There's multiple types. Most are rare. But it is, it is certainly not true that there's only one. Okay, the, the rest of the stuff, we should be able to pick up with these slides. Let me see. The slides are going to take us into connective tissue, so, so let's maybe look at this one real quick since we're talking still about epithelial tissue. We've got lines, the stomach, the small intestines, and the places like the large intestines. What type of epithelial tissue would this be? Stomach, small intestines, and large intestines. Here it is. This was our small intestines example. Simple columnar epithelial tissue would, is what you find lining the stomach, small intestines, and the colon. Uh, what about places like lining the urinary bladder and the ureters? That's the only place we find transitional epithelium. That's right. Now, when we were talking about the upper respiratory tract, like the trachea and some of those major bronchioles that go into the lungs, that, that's lined by what type of tissue? That pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue. So pseudostratified, always think trachea, uh, upper respiratory tract. The next one is the epidermis of the skin also lines the esophagus and the inside lining of the mouth. This is just stratified squamous. You may be thinking, well, epidermis of the skin, that's keratinized stratified squamous, and that's true. Lining the esophagus and the interior part of the mouth would be non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. So whether it's keratinized or not, both of these places are describing the stratified squamous epithelial tissue. But now when we get into those air sacs of the lungs or that kidney glomeruli that we looked at where there was just a thin layer of epithelial cells, this is where we're looking for simple squamous epithelial tissue. The first microscope has a picture of simple squamous epithelial tissue. We were looking at this picture last time, and it was really just that single layer of cells that are kind of flat, pancake-shaped. We're not concerned with all of this connective tissue below. Just that single layer of squamous-shaped cells. And then finally, we have secretary portions of small glands or the cells that line those kidney ducts, the kidney tubules. We saw the simple cuboidal epithelial tissue <coughs> lining those kidney tubes. It's also the types of tissue that you find on the surface of the ovary. Back here, we didn't pull it out yet, but there should be an ovary model. Here it is. Well, in the second half of the class, we'll eventually get to this ovary. 
And if you look at the surface of the ovary, you can see a single layer of these cube-shaped cells. So simple cuboidal epithelium. Down below that, well, this takes us into connective tissue. So let's jump into the slides and, and see where we can find each of these different types of connective tissue. Okay, we're through the membranes, so let's jump into the different types of connective tissue. I'm sure I'll erase this at some point. Let me jump in front of it uh, for the time being. This chart is going to show us how different types of connective tissue all formed. You can see all the different types of connective tissue, where the, whether it is supporting connective tissue, fluid connective tissue, or connective tissue proper. All different types of connective tissue has its roots in a type of tissue called mesenchyme. Mesenchyme tissue, we can think of this as, well, it's not correct to call it, it's not true stem cells yet, because these cells, these cells have already committed to becoming a type of connective tissue. Like a true stem cell has not yet committed to becoming any particular type of tissue. It's interesting to think that when you're born, every one of your cells are genetically identical and any cell could start to read the types of instructions and, and derive into a nervous tissue cell or a muscle tissue cell or a connective tissue cell. At some point in development, these cells start to specialize and only read certain sets of instructions of DNA. And this starts to change the way they look and, and they start to derive into these four different tissue types. One of those four different tissue types is connective tissue and mesenchyme tissue is the stem cell tissue that all connective tissue comes from. So I say it's kind of this semi stem cell material because it is not yet committed to becoming any particular type of connective tissue but it isn't going to become any of the other three types at this point. It's connective tissue. We'll see how it, what path it takes from, from mesenchyme. Here's a picture of that mesenchyme tissue. It is yet to differentiate into different types of connective tissue. So I think there's a question in the lecture notes that wants you to know that all connective tissue is derived from this type of stem tissue, this mesenchyme tissue. The first type of connective tissue that we'll mention once again is connective tissue proper. And when we did our concept map last time on the board, we separated connective tissue proper into two types. There was either loose connective tissue proper or dense connective tissue proper. We need to be able to be, uh, know there are three types of loose connective tissue. All three types we have images of over here. And I think I have the first type, this areolar tissue, set up under the scope. I do have the other two slides, adipose tissue and reticular tissue, that I'm willing to pop under the microscope. But I guess I sh I'm kind of reminded that you might not have known that I was going to stack the edges of the counters with these sharp pieces of glass. But they are on the edge of the counter. So just be very careful when you're going from one scope to the next that you don't accidentally knock them off of the counter because I've seen them stab the top of people's feet and it is not pretty. I don't know where else to put them other than next to the microscope. I have each slide next to the picture that we learned last time so that you can at least know what the slide is trying to show you. Anyway, back to this. I have microscopes set up over there that show us the three types of loose connective tissue and then a microscope set up uh, that is designated to the dense connective tissue. Let's start with loose connective tissue. The image that the microscope shows looks something like this and we'll learn this as our areolar tissue. It's the most common type of loose connective tissue. Uh, 
when we're thinking of this basement membrane, all epithelial tissue is anchored down to this type of connective tissue. It's a realer tissue. Quickly jumping to the next type of loose connective tissue, we can recognize this as adipose tissue. My label got cut off a little bit there, but we can see this is a photograph of adipose tissue and these large vacant spots are a dead giveaway that we're looking at adipose tissue. Typically triglycerides are stored here and that's why we said connective tissue is an energy storage molecule due to this adipose tissue. Here's a larger picture of adipose tissue and you can see sometimes when you just throw a slide under the microscope you can see a bunch of things that you didn't intend to see. This is dense regular connective tissue down here, all of these bands of collagen that are going in a similar direction. Uh, that's not what we're trying to see on this picture. I'm trying to show all of this adipose tissue. So the arrow, if I was pointing, if I was using this on a practical, I would have an arrow indicating the adipose tissue region. We've seen a realer tissue. We've seen adipose tissue. So that takes us then to the final type of loose connective tissue and we call this reticular tissue. There is a couple of pictures over here of reticular tissue. Here is the large and the small reticular tissue picture. It looks like what we see on the slide. Here's another picture of reticular tissue. The dead giveaway that we're looking at reticular tissue are all of these dark fibers that kind of have a branching pattern to them. What those reticular fibers are doing is they're acting, they are acting as anchor points for all of these cells to, to anchor themselves to. We can see them doing the same thing in this picture. They are acting as a anchor system for all of these cells to attach to. Reticular fibers are very delicate and organs like the spleen, the liver, and lymph nodes are held together almost entirely by these reticular fibers. Has anybody ever bitten into like a chicken liver or anything like that? It, the texture of it is definitely different than, than like biting into a steak or something like that because the liver is one of these organs that's, that's held together by reticular fibers. So it, it is very crumbly. It'll fall apart very easily. So the spleen would also be the same way thanks to all of these reticular fibers. That's the three examples of loose connective tissue. Now we're going to go look at the three examples of dense connective tissue three types of dense connective tissue. We'll start with dense regular connective tissue, then go to dense irregular connective tissue before seeing an example of elastic tissue. Here's our first example of dense regular connective tissue. Dense regular connective tissue is made entirely of these fibroblasts and a bunch of collagen fibers that are densely packed together. The reason that we call it dense regular connective tissue is that it looks like somebody has taken a comb through those collagen fibers and brushed them out so that they're all running more or less in the same direction as one another. You find dense regular connective tissue in place like ligaments and tendons. They either attach bones together or attach a muscle to a bone. Here's Obviously an example of both of those. A tendon is a muscle to bone connection. A ligament is a bone to bone connection. You find dense regular connective tissue in both places. Dense irregular connective tissue is comprised of the same thing. It's fibroblast and a bunch of collagen fibers, but the difference is that these collagen fibers are all tangled up. We, we uh, most commonly, we'll see this dense irregular connective tissue in the palm of the hand. This 
This slide that we're seeing is actually a cross section through the palm of the hand. And, and I added this slide in here because it compares dense regular connective tissue where those collagen fibers are brushed out and running more or less the same direction versus this dense irregular connective tissue where the collagen fibers are marbly. It looks like they're running multiple directions. I'll go back to this picture. This is showing an example from a, a joint capsule. This is a synovial membrane, and you also see dense irregular connective tissue there. So this would be just underneath the palm of the hand. When we look at some of these skin slides, I know that you can't see it just by looking at this particular slide, but this reticular layer of the dermis is going to be full of dense irregular connective tissue. I think that's a question in the lecture notes. The reticular layer of the dermis is where you find a lot of this dense irregular connective tissue. Dense regular is going to be in ligaments and tendons. Okay, so now let's look at the last type of dense connective tissue proper, and that is what we call elastic tissue. We said uh, don't confuse elastic tissue with elastic cartilage they look totally different. In elastic tissue, we can see multiple layers of elastic fibers. The elastic fibers are those dark squiggly little lines, and this looks like a lasagna of multiple layers of elastic fibers. And it, it's a cross section through the aorta, and you can really see with all that elasticity, the aorta can stretch out and accommodate this large volume of blood each time the heart pumps. So elastic fibers found in the wall of the aorta. I believe that's all of the connective tissue proper. So the next few slides should take us into supporting connective tissue. Supporting connective tissue, we said, were the three types of cartilage as well as bone. And this picture is kind of an overview of where we find the three different types of cartilage. The most common type of cartilage is hyaline cartilage. And we can see that any in, in any of the blue areas on this picture. So the, the cartilage of the rib cage, this is all hyaline cartilage. Uh, we can even see the bridge of the nose, this little piece of cartilage that you can grab onto. Uh, this is also hyaline cartilage. Even the ends of the long bones are covered in hyaline cartilage. That prevents the bones from grinding together. If you lose that hyaline cartilage and then the bones actually start to grind together, that's one form of arthritis. Okay, so hyaline cartilage is all over the place. Elastic cartilage, we're going to learn, is the least common type of cartilage. It's only found in two places that we can show. Uh, here it shows it in the earlobe. So the cartilage of the earlobe, this is elastic cartilage. I can bend my earlobe over, and when I let it go, it snaps back into its original spot thanks to those elastic fibers. So elastic cartilage in the ear. The only other place we can show elastic cartilage is in the larynx model. If I grab this large larynx, here is this floppy structure. It looks like a tongue, but we're going to call it the epiglottis, and it's on a, a hinge of elastic cartilage, so it's springy. So earlobe or the epiglottis are the two places we find elastic cartilage. Then we get to the last type of cartilage that we call fibrocartilage. It is the strongest of any of the types of cartilage, but it is intermediate in terms of how frequent we find it. Hyaline is the most common. Elastic is the least common. Fibrocartilage is somewhat in the middle in terms of how common it is. We see it in places like the meniscus of the knees. This is a joint that has to support all of the body weight. So we see additional cushions in the knees that are made out of fibrocartilage. You can also see the pubic symphysis. The, the two halves of the pelvic girdle are held together by this piece of fibrocartilage. And then the final place, I don't know if you can see it from here, but in between each of those vertebral discs, those intervertebral discs are made out of fibrocartilage. Again, that has to support a lot of the body weight. So in places where there is intense pressure, we find the fibrocartilage. 
If we look at what each type of cartilage looks like, this hyaline cartilage, like we said, the bridge of the nose or the rib cage, hyaline cartilage looks something like this, where you have cells, and in between these cells, there is nothing but blank, empty cellular matrix. You know, I'm, I'm just now having the thought that we are several examples into our connective tissue uh, before I wanted, I guess before it dawned on me to point out, when we were talking about epithelial tissue, we said one of the unique characteristics of epithelial tissue was that there were a bunch of cells very closely packed together. And now that we've been talking about connective tissue for a while, you can see in connective tissue that's not the case. There are relatively few cells and there's lots of extracellular matrix. And it's going to be the stuff that we find in that extracellular matrix that gives the different types of connective tissue their unique properties. So we see few cells, lots of extracellular matrix, and in hyaline cartilage, it's just blank, empty matrix. There's no fibers in there, no collagen fibers, no elastic fibers, just this ground substance. When we're looking at, at cartilage cells, let's try that again. When we're looking at cartilage tissue, we can see that the cells, the cartilage cells themselves, are hanging out in this little space that is called a lacuna. The cell itself is called a chondrocyte. Site just means mature cell. The prefix chondro means cartilage, so chondrocyte tells us a cartilage cell, and each cartilage cell is inside its own little space that we call a lacuna. How I think about this is, um, imagine if I were to get into a hammock and be, be nested into a little bit of a hammock, I would be the chondrocyte, and the hammock would be the lacuna that I would be sitting in. So we find chondrocytes inside these little spaces called lacuna. Let's look at elastic cartilage. Once again, we can see these big open lacuna, these spaces in which we find the cartilage cells, those chondrocytes. But now in elastic cartilage, we can see that that matrix in between those chondrocytes has running all through it these elastic fibers. Hyaline cartilage, no fibers in the matrix. Elastic cartilage, plenty of elastic fibers in this extracellular matrix. Finally, we've got fibrocartilage. We can still see those cartilage cells, those chondrocytes, inside their space called a lacuna. But in fibrocartilage, we can see there's an abundant amount of collagen fibers. It's really the abundance of collagen fibers that gives this type of cartilage its strength so it can support a lot of compression, a lot of body weight. The only other type of supporting connective tissue to mention is bone. And this is the only one that I don't have a good microscope slide of. I'll try and find one, but if we can't find a good bone slide, remember these laminated pictures of bone tissue are likely to be what ends up on the practical anyway. We can recognize bone tissue because it looks like these overlapping tree rings. We'll end up drawing this when we talk about how bone tissue grows. Right now we need to recognize it as a type of supportive connective tissue. Then we have, well, compact bone. It's just the edges of kind of the hard candy shell of bone. You can see these overlapping tree ring structures that we will call osteons. I threw this in there as a bonus slide. We'll, we'll just see bone tissue that, that, it, that looks like this. In case you're wondering where that comes from, it comes from the perimeter of bones. The interior of bone is where we find the spongy bone. Unit 2 stuff. We can recognize this as bone tissue. This is spongy bone tissue, so more on that later. In spongy bone, this is where you find red bone marrow. This is maybe a lecture review. We said in red bone marrow, this is where you find blood cell formation. 
So those little dots are new red blood cells that are forming, and then they're going to get released out into the blood vessels. Anyway, fluid connective tissue, we don't have lymph on the lab list, but we do need to be able to recognize blood as an example of our fluid connective tissue. There's one blood slide back there. It's going to look something like this. You can mostly just see a collection of red blood cells. You may see some white blood cells on there if you're lucky. They are rare. But in the second half of the class, we will learn each different type of white blood cell and what its unique function is. For now, we just have to recognize this as blood, a type of fluid connective tissue. I know I'm a little past break time, but I've only got a few slides left. So if I can get through that, we'll take a break. And the other side of the break, we'll just be looking at tissue examples for lab. We've gotten through epithelial tissue. We've gotten through connective tissue. And we know muscle and nervous tissue are the downhill slide. There's only three types of muscle tissue that we need to be aware of. There are laminated pictures of each one. And just before I go through this, let me refer you to this part of the lecture handout, where we're going to list the three different types of muscle tissue, as well as compare the three different types using these descriptive terms, like whether they are branching, whether there are structures called intercalated discs, whether they're formed out of long cylinders or whether they're spindle shaped. So here's where we're going to get those answers. It starts at this part of the lecture slides. If you're looking at that part of the lecture handout, then maybe write down that it's the skeletal muscles that appear in these long cylindrical shapes. So skeletal muscle, we can find skeletal muscle cells in these long cylindrical shapes. You can see that from the sketch of a skeletal muscle. You can also see that there are multiple nuclei in skeletal muscle cells. So we'll say long uh, cylindrical shaped cells that are multinucleated. You can also see this striped appearance, these alternating light and dark bands. Those we will call striations. And you see them in skeletal muscle. If I can jump to this picture, you also see those striations in cardiac muscle. So striations are something that you see in both cardiac muscle and uh, in both cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. If I jump to smooth muscle, those striations are no longer there. So striations are going to be unique to just cardiac and skeletal muscle. If we're comparing skeletal muscle to cardiac muscle, uh, we can see skeletal muscle, we can, they, they maintain these long cylindrical shapes. But in cardiac muscle, we can see there's more of a branching that occurs in these long muscle fibers. So cardiac muscle is where we see branching. And again, the sketch of the cardiac muscle does a good job of showing how this type of muscle tissue branches. It's also the case that cardiac muscle tissue may have one or two nuclei. So it's described as being uninucleated or sometimes binucleated. Remember, skeletal muscle was multinucleated. So there are some differences between cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. The only thing they really have in common are the striations. Another unique thing to cardiac muscle that we only find on cardiac muscle are these dark squiggly little lines called intercalated discs. Later we will learn those intercalated discs are just little gap junctions. They're like straws that are little hollow tubes that connect the cytoplasm of adjacent cardiac muscle cells. And as ions flow from one cell into the next, they cause that cell to contract. So the connection of all of these intercalated discs are really what allow this flowing current of contraction to ripple through heart tissue. Intercalated discs, they are unique to cardiac muscle. Now let's talk about smooth muscle. I just wanted to see if I had another picture of smooth muscle. 
I kind of think this picture is somewhat fuzzy, so it's kind of hard to see what's going on, but the sketch over here of smooth muscle, it's helpful. When we're describing smooth muscle, we can see that the cells are kind of spindle-shaped. They taper or they narrow at either end. And in the middle of each cell, right in the center of each smooth muscle cell, we can see a single nuclei. So smooth muscle cells are uninucleated. They do not have a striped appearance. And they taper at either end. What, what cardiac muscle and smooth muscle have in common is that they are both involuntarily controlled. We said skeletal muscle was the only one that we were in voluntary control of. So that should cross off all of the, character, the descriptive terms of smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and skeletal muscle. If I missed one, let me know. We can visually recognize skeletal muscle, we can visually recognize cardiac muscle, and we can visually recognize this smooth muscle. So the, the question here would have to be what type of muscle are we looking at? Is that smooth muscle? What is that? If it's not smooth muscle, it's the cardiac muscle. What about this one though? There's the smooth muscle. This is a little bit better quality smooth muscle. You can see how the nuclei are, are kind of tapered. They're, they're I think that smooth muscle and dense regular connective tissue are similar looking but look at smooth muscle, there are many more nuclei that you see. Remember there's a nuclei in each smooth muscle cell, so we can see a bunch of nuclei when looking at smooth muscle. Let me go back to dense regular connective tissue. Here is our dense regular connective tissue. There are not nearly as many nuclei that you see. It's primarily, like we said, the fibroblast and a bunch of collagen fibers. So going back to smooth muscle, a good example of smooth muscle, you can see just an abundance of these nuclei. And it gives you an idea that each of those cells are kind of uh, spindle-shaped tapering at both ends. They're kind of large in the middle where the nuclei is, but then they narrow in either direction. S uh, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. The only other type of tissue, well, this would be a good example of the skeletal muscle because we can see these cylindrical shaped cells go all the way across the screen. Finally now, nervous tissue, and there is one microscope in the back that has a slide that looks almost exactly like this. It's a little bit more of a zoomed out version of what we're looking at. When you look at that slide, you're going to see a bunch of these large neurons. Those are the ones generating electrical impulses. And then the tiny dots, we said, were the neuroglial cells, the supporting cast. They don't send any electrical impulses, but we'll list a... a a bunch of functions they are responsible for that all help those neurons do their job, which is sending those electrical currents. So that is just a couple of more slides. These are all showing nervous tissue. This is just a labeled slide. We can see the big neuron and we can see all of the tiny neuroglial cells. We'll learn that there are six different types of neuroglial cells. They're all smaller than the larger neurons. Uh, maybe just note that for every one neuron that we have, there are about 10 of these neuroglial cells. So they outnumber neurons 10 to 1. They're just so much smaller than neurons.